hello, hello, Fox. Eli, in the garden. And today we're actually showing you the garden and we're going to talk about our garden. So it's going to be a brilliant one for all you new guys that haven't watched the videos talking about how we designed it and haven't seen a lot of the tours we did over last year. So we're going to have a walk around, talk about the different areas and tell you all about it. Now, one of the awesome things we do, and it is just a bit of fun, is Kate drew this fantastic graphic that shows the whole garden and all the different areas. And I'm going to use that today to show you where I am to help you get your mind's eye of what's going on. And we've got little daft, funny names that we give different areas of our garden to. Um, and if you're not from the UK, you won't get it. But we've got a gardening TV show here by somebody called Monty. It's called Gardener's World. And he's got a huge piece of land with multiple gardens. And it's called Long Meadow. So what we do, as a joke, we call this Short Meadow. And we have our different gardens here, but really they're just parts. So that's the names you'll hear me calling. You guys have seen me start a lot of videos from right here, but I've never started a garden tour from here or any of the videos talking about our garden and how we designed it because it's actually a really new little spot. Now, for the moment, I'm going to call it Strawberry Corner. You'll understand for the moment in a second, but also it's not properly on our garden diagram because it is so new and Kate drew our little garden picture before we had this so I might have to get her to do an update um, but we did this we started this last year when we had some really crazy snow oh Kate we've been in had lunch so job two for this afternoon is new strawberry planters and we're going to use these pallets to do them there's loads of these type of videos online Kate's come up with her own idea for a, a bit of the garden we want to put it in. So we're regretting going in for lunch now because now we're really cold because we've been indoors. We're doing our best. So we started building these pallet planters for the strawberries because that whole thing about trying to use all the space you've got to the best that you can, um, which is a, a key thing if you like us, you're in a city garden, a small garden, and um, use the space wisely. And this let us use vertical space because previously the strawberries had always been in this bed and they took up an entire bed. So this was a way to claim back a bed and still keep our strawberries, hence strawberry corner. Now I love this little corner. I, when it's nice, I come out here in the mornings and sat with a coffee, sat here with a book. It's kind of like my little quiet kind of mindfulness kind of space. Um, and it's just beautiful when the strawberry plants are all really green and the strawberries going and stuff. And you've seen it in the videos, it can be so beautiful. Um, however, there are changes afoot for this corner, which is why I thought I would sit here and chat to you about it. It will no longer be Strawberry Corner because we're moving the strawberries. I'm not 100% happy with strawberries in these planters. We're keeping the planters, however, and I will tell you lots more about this. I'm going to do a video specifically on it, but we're going to move these. So what am I going to call this corner then? It's probably a good time to do this. So before I get Kate to redo that little plan, what is this? Any suggestions, guys? A good generic name for this space so that no matter what we plant, it fits. <sighs> so, this is a garden. I always say a garden, it's not an allotment, it's not a farm, it's not a small holding, it's just a normal garden. But it is a very productive garden. So I've got two grown spaces. This is my main one, as in the biggest, that grows the most variety. And it's basically, I've got these outdoor raised beds with hinged covers on them. Just it makes it nice and convenient. Um, normally you'll see covers that the actual net gets unclipped and rolled up and things. That's the kind of traditional way of doing it. And that's how we started. But I just find this is much, much more convenient. But this is where we grow all of our outdoor crops. So things like our beetroot, our carrots, our courgettes, all of that stuff is here. 
the vegetable garden. Couldn't think of a better name for it. So part of our planning for creating our garden then was to think about where to plant our vegetables because you want somewhere that's slightly sheltered, gets a decent amount of sunlight. Sheltered because you don't want those harsh winds hitting your plants. They can damage the plants. They can actually, sort of the equivalent of frost burn, you get that with wind as well. They can cause plants to fall over or snap or grow in funny directions. Um, and also it chills and it makes it a lower temperature in that area. You want a decent amount of sun, but you also have to think about what you're growing. If all of your veg beds are in the sun, is the sun going to be too strong and damage any of them, like happens in the greenhouse? Or are there some things that don't like a lot of sun? So when you're designing, you kind of think about what you're going to be growing. And that goes for the vegetable crops, fruit crops and all your flower crops. It's part of what you think about. Fruit crops, as I said, over here, you've seen that. Let's, again, this isn't on our garden plan because it is new and has happened since Kate created our garden plan for you guys. So another update. But this is, I think I'm going to call it the fruit wall because this fence has all of our blackberries growing along it. And you saw me do this back in September in the vlog where we actually cut the canes, kept the new canes and tied them in along the fence so that it's neat and tidy and so that they were protected from the wind and the fact that they're very, very big. So they were snapping before they got um, tied into the fence. I've also got a small blueberry plant here. Um, blueberries, we've struggled with blueberries. We never ever get more than a handful really and I've done everything the books and other YouTubers say I should. So I'm going to give it one more season and see and I may just get rid of them. Um, we did used to have red and black currants uh, and they were incredibly successful. They're so easy to grow and you get massive harvests. But we discovered we don't actually like to eat them. I love how they look, but we really didn't like them. So our neighbours got them now. But this, this is our fruit wall. And again, it's making use of space. Again, it's vertical space. Out of the way, I didn't need another bed or pots to keep this going anywhere else in the garden. And it's in a spot that gets a decent amount of sun. Remember I said about the hinges? So this one there, sorry I wasn't speaking to you honey, Kate's working away in the background. <laughs> so the hinges make it so easy that I can just do this and reach in, no kind of undoing at all and that kind of thing. Um, but anyways, this, um, we're going to call this bed number three, that will become apparent in a couple of videos down the line. But at the moment it's got broccoli rab or the broccoletto quarantino riccio that you guys saw me sow in this bed. Now. This should have been a 45 day crop in perfect weather and all that kind of stuff. So you guys saw me sow it um, and I was inspired by Steve from Greenside Up because he was growing this stuff. Now we both did it differently. Steve had already sown his in his polytunnel under cover, brought it on and then planted out. And that was when I saw his video and was inspired. So that week I sowed seeds direct into this bed and some in the greenhouse. Mine's, this lot is ready to harvest and I'm actually going to be harvesting this later for pizza for tonight's dinner which is the whole reason I grew this. Oh, it's a big story with me and the pizza. But this has actually not taken 45 days. It's taken 70 days because I sowed it probably three weeks behind Steve's plants. And at the time of year when things were just starting to cut over from late summer into autumn. So the temperature had started to drop and the light levels had really started to drop, which meant the plants growth slowed down. And this is one of the things, you don't have to quit growing. And this is my experiment for this year. What can I grow autumn and winter? Things slow down a lot. Some things won't grow, other things will. You have to just try it, and be patient and see. So this side of the bed is the broccoletto that is ready to harvest. And I can see now one of them has actually flowered. So I need to get this harvested. This side of the bed is a bit further behind and this is the stuff I brought out from the greenhouse which had kind of stalled. So I've brought it out to try and see if I can spur it on to go. So that's everything that's in this bed at the moment. 
But when this lot's gone, I'll be thinking about this bed for next year. <laughs> this is bed number two. You're going to have to come in really close for this one. This bed, it's bed number two. But for next season, this is going to be referred to as the onion bed. <laughs> Basically because we've got garlic on this side, we've got our onions on this side. And you guys know onions is a first for us this year. We've never grown them before, so it's quite exciting. We're also going to finally be putting the spring onions in this bed. So the entire bed will be the onion family, hence the onion bed. At the moment, oh, for Garlic Watch Wednesday, let me show you where we stand, because I know some of you guys planted your garlic along with me. So let's have a look. This is definitely a GoPro one, but right here is the very first garlic shoots. Now, I've had to dig this out to show you because I've actually mulched the vegetable beds. It is that time of year and if you don't mulch, as usual, I've already got a brilliant video on this, even if I do say so myself. So I will link it up at the top and I'll put it in the description. But I use straw to mulch my vegetable beds out of ease and I explain that in the video. Um, it's also a way of keeping your soil really nice and toasty and protecting things in here from the worst of the chill. It's also good because it covers your soil and helps to stop just the weather over winter from eroding any of the nutrients out of it and all that kind of thing um, so that you can be ready to go in spring. And come spring, on a mulched bed, the soil is just a tiny bit warmer to start with, so it's a good thing to do. I'll go into it in more detail in the video and try to be quick here, but this is the first of my garlic. Now here's the thing, because I have mulched my bed after I sowed all the garlic and onions and things, you can't necessarily see those little shoots coming up, um, which is not so great for doing kind of garlic watch Wednesday and stuff. But it's awesome for just protecting everything from harsh frosts and what have you. And there you go, Kate fans. That's her in the background now, trimming up some of the plants. See, you never see behind the camera the stuff that's going on. So just because I've got the GoPro in my hand, you're getting it. Wave to your fans, Kate. <laughs> right, so... In this side garlic, I am pretty sure there are other shoots coming up in there. In fact, I know there are because I have seen them, but I'm not going to go poking around just to find them for the sake of a video for the moment. But yes, garlic, we have our very first shoots. So you guys who are growing along garlic with us in, have you got shoots yet? Onions? Mm. Unsurprisingly, nothing yet, but it won't be long. The other thing we have here, however, is peas. I have three little pea plants here. And these are the pea plants that are from the peas, meteor peas. I sold as that experiment a few weeks back um, where I was trying to see if I could get peas to grow outdoors at this time of year and keep them going until spring to give them a head start. And I also tried to get some peas going in the greenhouse. So I mentioned the peas in the greenhouse. That's it. That's all it took. Now, a whole thing with the peas then. I'm, gi I'm giving you top secret stuff for next year yet. We're not actually going to grow peas next year. But more on that when I do my succession planting planning video in a couple of weeks. Okay, last bed. Hmm. A few things to mention here. There is more of the broccoletto in this bed. Again, this is the stuff that came from the greenhouse and was behind. So I put it out here to see if a bit more space and some more nutrients would boost it and I would be able to get a harvest before it just gets killed off with the weather. It's one thing. Other thing in this bed is the last of my lettuce. Now this is gem lettuce, but it is not the winter lettuce. So if we get a, a really bad frost, I think this will get killed off, but I've not got many left and the ones that I do have are starting to bolt anyway. Um, so we'll get these used up soon and hopefully the ones in the greenhouse will be coming along enough that that will then be the next lot of crops. <sighs> the other thing I realised as I sat here, 
can't remember if this is bed one or three. I can't remember what I called the one at the end. Can you? Three. Three, so that would make this bed one. Well, well, see, the thing is, I could have not mentioned it and then just decided and drew things in the plan later, but you know, this is you seeing the honest behind the scenes bit. The other thing with this bed then, talking about designing of the garden, I did mention in the video where I talked about before you create a raised bed garden, things to think about. One of them is being able to get around your bed so that you can reach in easily and get to the plants to harvest, to weed, to sow, to look after things. So you'll notice this bed opens the opposite way from the other two because colourful corner is here. So I didn't want this bed opening onto all of the plants, the flowers, the bushes, the elder here, because it would damage things. So this bed opens in that direction. But there's a gap here, so I can still get in from this side and reach across. And it's one of the things about having the hinges, you need to remember that that means you can't get in from that side because it's fixed. So you need to be able to reach across your bed. So don't put a hinged hoop cover on a bed that's too wide for you to reach all the way across. Excellent tip. Okay, where am I going next? Uh, no idea, because I don't know what you're doing. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Do you see what I have to put up with? She thinks just because she's doing the actual hard work in the garden, she gets away with it. <laughs> don't leave the GoPro in there. Here's an interesting thing. Three beds. You will see two have the EnviroMesh insect netting on them. One only has the standard bird netting on it. This changes depending on what I'm growing in the beds and you have to think about that. So here I was growing pak choy and my broccoletto. Those were very attractive to caterpillars. So all the moths and butterflies were getting in, laying their eggs on these and then the caterpillars were just munching it. Case in point, we didn't get any pak choy from this bed because it got munched. And that's why I put the Enviro Mesh on here, because it's super, super fine and stops those insects getting in and laying eggs. Bed number one, however, is bird netting on there because what I tended to grow in this bed wasn't a problem with caterpillars and that kind of thing. Even though I've got lettuce in this bed, they didn't seem to be bothered. Possibly because the main crop in this bed was my big courgette plants and I think maybe scent and the size of the leaves and things protected the lettuces maybe um, but also because of the big flowers it attracted pollinators. Two things, I want this net on here to allow things like bees and things in to pollinate my courgettes, that's really important. So I don't want it too fine. But I do need something on here because we have a real problem with what we think are neighbourhood cats digging in the beds and basically using them as a toilet. So for us, the majority of the time that we've got nets on the beds is to stop that happening. Apart from the strawberry bed, that when it used to be the bottom, uh, the nets there were to stop the birds eating the strawberries. <laughs> So, things to think about. I'm going to go and join Kate at the back. Hello, wife. Hello. What can you do This is the beer garden. Although I think in some videos I called it the sun garden and got muddled up. Or the gin garden. The gin garden. Basically, this is where we come and sit when it's not freezing cold in Pelton Marine. But that's Kate's chair. This is my chair. We sit here. The sun is usually over there in the evening, so it's just perfect. <sighs> but it does mean this is one of our big focuses for where we like it to look nice, to be a nice space to be in, to chill. So we've got lots of nice flowers around us. If you guys are grown, perfect things we have found stunning. Cosmos just have been fantastic this year and have lasted forever. Um, I've forgotten the name, thank you. Calendula, I'm looking at it and can't remember the name. Calendula, stunning and I've got my orders. Apparently we're now growing that again for next year and thereafter. Again, lasted for ages, looked amazing. Lots of flowers. Marigolds, these guys, Still going. These have lasted longer than any marigolds we've ever grown. So they obviously like this bit of the garden. 
but I'm going to show you my pride and joy. Some of you guys who've been here for a while are going to recognise this straight away. And I'm going to bring you in close. I'm guessing you don't mind if I invade your space a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Way back, probably last November even, video up in the top left and in the description. However, I did a video for you guys about taking cuttings and I used my blackcurrant sage to do that. And I took those little tiny cuttings. This is it. Two survived and have grown to be this stunning pot here. It's just gorgeous. Now, these guys, although technically um, it's a salvia and technically these are perennials, Again, the whole talking about your garden, knowing your garden, designing where things go and what you grow. Although these guys are perennials, they're not generally perennials in our neck of the woods. They don't stand harsh winters. So you may say that they're... Um, I've forgotten the word. Semi-hardy. Thank you. I was going to say tender, they're not. They're semi-hardy, meaning if you can protect them from the worst of the weather and frost, they'll do fine. And you'll see that I moved, I think last December, again, I'm just going to put a big list of videos in the description and up there for you. I moved the original plant over to the bed by the fence, which I'll show you in a second, and it survived right through winter. Lost its leaves and what have you, but it's come back amazing. This guy is over here by the greenhouse. I'm not sure if he'll do okay there, so he might get moved. But it is that whole, I want to keep them rather than grow again every year. Um, one way of doing that is to take cuttings like I did. But I'm going to try and keep this guy going as he is. So I may have to move him. But I'll put him back and I'll take you over to the fence bed. I think I used to call it the walled garden. Because, you know, I've tried to pretend we're posh. Now, another thing about this area, this beer garden, sun garden, kind of our spot, really. This bed we put in last year, and again, we did it in a video. We actually built this in one of the videos as we changed everything up. We took the trees, which these two are prunus, two uh, cherry trees. We took them out of the pots they were in because we weren't sure they were particularly happy. And we put them into the bed to see if giving them some space and some good soil and what have you would really bring them on a bit. Um, and they seem to have done better. Uh, trees are a real difficulty in our garden because of the wind. The wind just burns them and they struggle. Um, but also, we had a very empty bed. So I put a few kind of bulbs and things in that I took from other areas of the garden, which didn't do great. But I also sowed some seeds for Obricia, Mimulus, that kind of thing, things we love. And they have done really well. You can see here um, to the point where at certain points last year, they absolutely mugged this bed and nothing else could grow properly. Um, so it's something to think about is don't over sow or over plant. Some plants need light and space and what have you. And if you put too much in here, it can just kill other plants. So one of the problems we had was that we had some sea holly in here and they just got really leggy and tall fighting for light. And I'm a bit slow in showing you, but there is one here you can see, and it's climbed up really, really high, and they weren't meant to get that big. So uh, we'll see how that goes for next year when we clean this bed out and give everything a bit of space and light. So something to think about. But also, these begonias have done stunning, and we love them because the white flowers make them really stand out here. So it's that nice contrast. If we're sitting here, they smell nice, they attract the bees and what have you. They look good in the bed. From our kitchen window, we can see these when we're washing up and things. It's just fantastic. But one thing, there are two little things in here that we're going to have to think about. Number one, this little Japanese Acer is not doing so well. Um, now, we do struggle with trees. We've lost an Acer already from this garden. So I don't know if we will be able to make the best of him. But we're wondering if he's just been outcompeted in this bed and we may move him. We're thinking about putting him over there nearer the house so he's sheltered from the wind. We'll see. We'll let you know if we do that and how it goes. The other thing, job for today, 
This back fence used to be covered in clematis and it has the most amazing white flowers in the early spring. Train. But Kate was over here tidying up. Um, I can't remember when. Kate, when did you tidy up over here and discover the clematis? Last night, was it? Kate was out doing a mad cutting of the grass before it rained last night because she didn't want you guys seeing things not neat. Um, and she discovered that this clematis had pretty much fallen off the fence. So today we're going to tie it back up and get it arranged nicely again. But we're wondering as well, clematis, if you grow them, they like their roots to be shaded. They like cool roots. So when we used to have this full of the big grasses and things, the roots were all covered and shaded. But they like their leaves and flowers to be in full sun. Now, we wonder if it's tried to move to get more sun because planting these trees here, it's covering it and it never used to be covered. And you'll notice it's all ended up kind of in this gap in the middle. So we're going to keep an eye on that and see. We've got plans for here, but that's another video we'll tell you about. the fence bed. Sometimes I've called it the walled garden. Now, I'm going to crouch down actually. Oh, it's just for my old legs. You guys watched us actually extend this. This used to be just about that wide and we had a paving stone, normal paving stone path here. In fact, it was there. Um, what we did was we decided it was too thin um, so we didn't get a lot in it. Because it's right up against this fence, it doesn't actually get a lot of light because the sun rises over there and sets over there. So the fence actually shades a good chunk of this side of the garden. And it's the same with the satu tree that I'll show you in a second. We basically don't get any light in the satu tree. We get very little in this bed. Um, so a lot of what we plant in here has to be happy to be in the shade but you do find that a lot of the plants like the black currant sage will lean forward because it's reaching to get the light so it's things to think about when you're planting but what we've done here is we've got a lot of little kind of woodland type plants because they like dappled shade so things like primrose do awesome here violas, pansies, that kind of stuff. Those do fantastic in this bed and they give you those little bursts of colour. And those guys last a long time. We get flowers from these right through until it gets crazy harsh in winter. And we've also got cyclamen in here as well, which we've chosen variegated leaves. So the leaves give you a bit of interest and it'll flower and give you a burst of colour. So it's a little bit of thought has gone in here. Now, I also have, uh, there used to be a tree here. We had a rowan, but it actually got damaged by the fence because this fence is relatively new. And um, we got new neighbors who wanted a higher fence for privacy. Um, so the tree had already been there for about 30 years. And unfortunately the new fence touched it. So whenever it was windy and the tree moved, eventually over time it just wore through the bark and the tree got an infection that killed it off and it actually came down in a storm a few years ago um, but what we do still have is our schemia which I love and they again they're evergreen so you'll always have greenery so you'll always have colour but you get berries little red berries on them at this time of year that then develop into gorgeous little flowers in kind of March time and the scent is absolutely amazing they're some of my favourites um, I've got my crocosmia. I love crocosmia, so I've got two types in this bed. I've got the lucifer, which are the red tall ones. And again, it's very structural. If I, if I move a bit, it's very, very structural. They're, they're strong, they're tall, they're, they really stand out. And I do love these. And I've got the little orange crocosmia over on that side of the bed. And I am collecting seeds and trying to get more of the orange ones because I really like them. They're much smaller, but they also both flower at different times. So it always gives colour. Because when you're designing your flower beds or just generally your garden, you want to think about what it's going to look like at different times of the year because you want colour and leaves and structure and things all year if you can. So you need to think about where are the gaps? When will those gaps fill? Why are there gaps? What can I plant there? 
And you saw me mention this when we planted the spring bulbs because I've got things like their strandia behind me that will be tall and bushy and flower at certain points, but it dies back in autumn and winter and it takes a little bit to go going in the year. So just now that's dying back and leaving a gap. So what do I put there for now? So this is the original blackcurrant sage or it's a salvia. So I bought this from um, Urban Herbs as part of a cocktail collection of herbs. It's meant to give you real kind of strong blackcurrant flavours and smells and you can add it to cocktails and things. So two things with that. Number one, um, doesn't taste anything like blackcurrant. It's, it's got quite a distinctive kind of smell to it and it's recognisable that it's this plant. It's not blackcurrant, so we've never used it as a herb that we eat or to flavour things or anything like that. But also, I assumed, because I didn't do my research, I assumed it was a herb, therefore it would be small. So I put it into our herb planter. And you can see it's actually quite a large shrub. Um, so I moved it from the herb planter over here, thoroughly expecting that it was going to die. It wouldn't survive. It, like I mentioned earlier, these guys are not hardy in our garden, so I just didn't expect it to thrive at all. But look at it now, it's looking fantastic. Um, this is one of my big photography challenges. When this is going properly in summer, the flowers are just the most vibrant pink and I cannot get a good photo of them because the colour of the camera just can't cope with the colour. I love this guy. But yes, um, he's going to get a prune because he is quite big and taken over. We love our hanging baskets and we have 10 in this garden. It can be a challenge. So um, summertime, usually the baskets are full of petunias and I grow those from seeds and some years we've had the most stunning display in our baskets. Last year we struggled quite a bit, but just now, because it's winter, what do you do if you want some winter colour in your baskets? We've gone with cyclamen in them. Stunning. It gives you those lovely variegated leaves and then the little flowers give you those bursts of colour. And they're great for kind of autumn, winter time in your garden as well. So if you're fancying some winter baskets, cyclamen actually work really well. That's what we've done along this fence and on the shed and at the front of the house. The two baskets on the back of the house we've not touched. They've got dying petunias in them. We just ran out of cyclamen. Definitely, this year, this has been a great find for me and I'll be doing it again. This is the Satutari. Satutari is not a real word, it's a Scottish word, a made up word. Um, just, it means anywhere that you sit outside in your garden. So usually it's on a patio, but as I mentioned before, this area of the patio does not get any sunlight and it can get quite cold. So we don't use this bit as often as we used to. It's, again, it's because of the, the high fence. It's cut a lot of our sunlight out. So we tend to sit at that side of the garden. But this is still a nice little area. If we're sitting out and having a meal with friends and what have you, it's handy for the table and chairs. It's near the patio doors. That means we can see it from inside the house. So it's kind of important for us that it is a nice area to look at as well. So we've got the fence here and we've got some hanging pots. This year, this has been one of my favourites. This is called By De Bop. Okay, one of my absolute favourites. Potted all them up this year and will again. It just flowers and flowers and flowers. This guy's not looking so good. Kate's just trimmed them back. This is one of Kate's favourite flowers ever. It's a New Guinea Impatience. Again, it should be a perennial, but they don't survive over winter in our garden, really. So we just do fresh flowers every year. We grow them from seed because you can collect seeds from them. I've got some colourful planters here, sort of reds and greens. And this one, this is a golden tower or an elder. Um, this one's got green leaves. We've got one at that side that's got the dark leaves. But this guy, when we got them, we planted them over in the herb bed before it was a herb bed, but he really didn't like it there. So he never grew more than maybe a foot tall, always looked really poorly. 
we moved him here just to try where he's much more sheltered here from the wind because this little bit doesn't get a lot of wind and he just took off much much taller as you can see in the space of a few months he got to that height he doesn't really do much in the way of flowers and berries and things though so we're still working on this we're getting him the exact spot he likes and the same as the black elder on that side of the garden got very very tall not an awful lot in the way of flowers and foliage so you know it's stuff we're working on um, the problem being he loses all his leaves so it does get a little bit bare over here over winter because our planters have lots of aquilegia in them which again is summer kind of flowering and leaves and stuff so it's the summer interest so we're still kind of working out this area but yeah um paniculata hydrangea is here just now because it's very very tall and doesn't do well with the wind and once you move it out of this area it gets battered and actually blown over by the wind quite a lot so he's here just now and you can see he's just starting to pass but this is our satutary and you'll recognise it because even if you don't see me here in a lot of videos, our main photo on all our social media of Kate and I were sitting here having a meal. But also, I used to start an awful lot of the videos off sitting on these steps, usually with a cup of tea or a coffee. Um, and that was before I got my little corner over there. So you'll recognise this corner. Now, directly opposite is where I refer to as colourful corner. So let's go there. So this is Colourful Corner, called that for two reasons. Number one, it's lots of colourful planters and pots. And again, it's these greens and pinks. We've got this throughout the two gardens, the front and the back, um, just because it was nice and fun. But also, this has a lot of our big blousy flowers. So the gazania or the African daisies at the front. You guys know I absolutely adore them. They're some of my favourite flowers. I photograph these a lot because they're just stunning to photograph. Variegated colours on the petals, really, really open. They're just stunning. So osteopernum then, there are two here just now. This purple one and there's an orangey yellow at the front, which came from the front garden. Again, where it was got hammered by wind and was getting knocked over, so we brought it here. We've got a couple in the beds out front as well, which I'll show you when we go out front. But I adore these. They're big, bushy, beautiful, big, open, daisy-like flowers. These have been a real favourite for me this year. So I'm wanting to grow much more of those. Now also... The elder, this guy. This is a black elder, um, so it's got the dark purple leaves and the dark purple berries. Um, he has done very well in the fact that he's grown incredibly tall, a lot of new growth. Not a huge amount of flowers, but it's his first year this year, so we'll see what he does next year. But one of the things we do need to do this guy and the one over there, we need to give them a really hard prune because we want to encourage it to bush out for next year. So to put out more side shoots and in turn more foliage and be a fuller plant because they're quite long and straggly. And as I mentioned, it's a real issue with wind in our garden and any tall plants, trees, etc. They tend to get scalded on the tops because of the wind. It comes over this gate and fence and just blows very strong across the garden and it's quite a chilly wind. So it burns a lot of the taller plants, which is why we struggle with trees. But yeah, this is Colourful Corner. Remember I mentioned the whole hanging basket thing? Again, it's cyclamen, and the light colours, like the whites, the pinks, stand out nicely against the brickwork. Quite chuffed with them. Hanging baskets are difficult here because because of the overhang, they do not get any of the rain when it falls because the rain doesn't fall in the direction to get to them. So they take a lot of effort of making sure they get watered. But we've also got these two beds at the front. Now, when I did the video talking about how we designed our gardens, I showed you some of the old photos of what this looked like when we bought the house. So you can see that these are new gardens. The rockery is new, the shrubbery is new, the lawn is new. None of this was here. So it was a lot of thought about what the garden looks like. Kate calls it curbside appeal. That whole when you look at a house and you go, oh, that looks really nice. So we put in these two flower beds and we've got shrubs and flowers in them. So yet again, Osteopernum, it's doing stunning, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the African daisies or the gazania, love them, the really bright orange ones out here. But also, we've got 
two camellia, one at either side. And here's an awesome thought for when you're designing your garden. That one flowers like crazy. That one really struggles. That one is much bigger, much smaller. It's not a big distance between the two, but you can see small differences make a big difference to plants. A few metres. Obviously, there's differences in what one gets the most wind, the most light, the most water, that type of thing. It's always great to look back in your garden over the years. And that's one of the reasons I talk about keeping a garden in journal. It's so handy to record these kind of things. Um, and that's where these garden tours became really good for us because they kind of became a journal for us that was very visual. And I love looking back and seeing things. Now, we've also got the rockery and the shrubbery. Let's start with the rockery. This space does different things at different times of year. So you saw recently that Kate and I added these white stone chip to try and make the plants that were in here pop a bit because it is very much a lot of succulents and alpine type plants. In spring, we get lots of flowers here and they tend to be purples. But outside of that time of year, things were getting lost an awful lot. So hence we put the white chips in. Now, again, this wasn't here, this is new. We made this recently. Um, so, it is a pile of these bricks that we lifted that had been here and that's what we used for the rocks because, you know, if you've ever gone and bought proper rocks for a rockery, they're really expensive. So we just used those and a bit of earth and made our bed here. Um, there is a random shrub there, you can see it matches one in the bed, um, it self-seeded and or moved underground or however, but it's appeared there. It's not really a rockery plant, but it's quite embedded. So instead, we just have to prune it really hard and keep it small. Uh, there's more gazanias there, just because I love them. And again, this is about what it looks like in the garden from all angles, including from our front window when I look at the window. So there are things that I like to look at. Um, doesn't look its best just now, but spring it does look stunning. I've shown you this in videos a lot. Um, and even when I did the video in spring last year and shown you all the bulbs that are along there, this guy looked amazing. And it's the same, the shrubbery, where Kate's Japanese maple is, that tree. So we put the shrubbery in at the same time as the rockery. In fact, the same weekend. And... <laughs> The most stunning bit here is the tree. This is Kate's Japanese maple. Now, it's not looking its best just now. If we had filmed this three days ago, it would look so much better. But we just had crazy wind and storms that have curled up and taken off a lot of the leaves. But in summer and early autumn, it is stunning. When the light hits it, it's on fire. Um, this is a lot of shrub. So we've got a lot of azaleas here, which flower and look amazing, as well as the tree, lots of blasts of colour. But also, we've got a mixture of evergreen and deciduous in here, so it changes up the seasons. Um, little hellebore in the pot, this is new, we'll see how this goes. But this maple, if I take you back to the video where I spoke about how we designed the garden, this maple was a stick tiny and that was only I think nine years ago so it shows you how much a tree can grow in that time so have a think if you're planting trees about the size they grow to and where you want them because we now wish we hadn't put it here because it's right at the end of the garden at the end of the driveway and we think maybe we should have had it somewhere further this way maybe um because one day I think it's going to interfere with being able to see when we come out the driveway but yeah so this is the front garden this bit of the garden doesn't have a name. It's just the box where we keep all the recycling. Uh, Kate's bucket, because she's currently deadheading. Sorry. Speak of the devil. Um, the hose is here, but I just wanted to show you this bush. Now, do you know the proper name for this? We just say smoke bush. It so if you know... the begins with the sea, it'll come back to me. If you know what it is, tell us. But I just wanted to show you it. It will lose its leaves over winter and it'll just go back to being sticks. But doesn't it look totally stunning just now, this colour? That's all. I just wanted to show you it because right now I think it looks gorgeous. But if you know its proper name, give us a shout. Don't guess if you actually know, give us a shout. So obviously we're in the greenhouse, in fact, we're in the green, so let me put this down because it's really hot. 
and I don't want to spill it and burn myself when I'm not paying attention. Um, so we're in the greenhouse. It's another of the growing areas in our garden. We've got two of our food growing areas, the vegetable garden, that is the three raised beds, and along the fence. And this, the greenhouse. Now, would you believe the greenhouse is the second most famous growing area in our garden? The first, obviously, being the raised beds and the hinged nets that are on them. The video we made way back when we made those, it's one of our most watched videos ever on this channel. So even though there's a lot of you guys who come here just for the greenhouse growing, the veg beds are actually way more popular. So we're in the second favourite area now for food, um, and it's the greenhouse. And we're in because I've got some chores to get done in here today, and it lets me talk about the greenhouse a little bit for some of you new guys, get some stuff done, and I'll give you an update of what's going on. So what we're doing in here today then? So in the last video, I came in here just to get out of the rain and the wind and I had a bit of a tidy up and I was telling you guys that I moved the Vitapod because I wanted to do a kind of temporary bed type thing for my greens. And I've done that. It is behind me. But today I'm going to do the second one because I've got a lot of stuff. Here we go, I'll show you them. In these amazing container-wise containers. But the problem is... The plants that are in them now are too big to be in there, really. And I mentioned how the Broccoletto Quarantino... No, what? I'm not going to keep the Broccoletto Quarantino Riccio, but I'm just going to say Broccoli Rab. Um, the Broccoli Rab that were in them, I think, outgrew them and ran out of nutrients. Because, you know, it's only the size of a small pot. In normal circumstances, these would get planted out before that happened. But because we're in here in the greenhouse, I didn't get that done because I was trying to think of how I would do it. And I think some temporary beds are the solution. Now, temporary beds. Because in the greenhouse, I grow in pots. It's a system that suits me for what I'm doing and I've no intentions of changing it. But when you're growing stuff in a greenhouse, polytunnel, etc. over winter, having beds in there is fantastic because you can grow more in beds physically. You can use more in that same amount of space. The beds will hold more nutrition than a pot because there's a lot more soil in there. The beds will stay quite warm because I keep saying the phrase thermal mass, okay? It's about the amount of stuff that holds heat. A bed, the soil in there will do that for a lot longer than just a pot, okay? So there's all these reasons why you'll see people in polytunnels with great big vegetable beds growing right through winter. And a lot of folk just close up their greenhouse for the winter or only use it to put things in to protect them from frost. Hence, this is my first year trying to properly grow in here. So that was a long way around for saying that I'm making some temporary small beds. I'm just using what I've got around so it's nothing fancy. I've just got some grow bag trays. The one at the back, this is the bottom tray for a big sun tunnel propagator. Um, I'm using that. and It's just a test to see. You know, cause I've thought, I'll experiment, see how it goes. You guys like coming along on my experiments. It might give you some ideas. So that's it. So my greenhouse is very much somewhere I grow in pots because it suits what I grow and how I grow. The problem with that is when I'm not using them, I have to find somewhere to store all my like quad grows and all that kind of stuff. So it gets a bit, yeah. But here we go. That's what I'm doing today anyway. So, so a wee update while we're in here then. In the Vitapod, I have got things like that's the dragon's tongue mustard that I just sold in the video the other week. It's doing okay. Um, today in here, I'm actually going to get some of that in a bit of a bigger bed. I'll explain in a second. But what I'm doing is, these are all the bits and pieces that were out up on the shelf staging behind me. I couldn't remember the word there. Um, all I'm doing is they're in here out of the way. They're not in here necessarily because they need the heat that the Vitapod can give. It's not nearly cold enough for that at the minute. They're just in there because it's a surface convenient um, and it's just acting like a normal propagator like I use all the time. It is switched on and I mentioned this last week. Even though it's switched on, it's not actually heating because it's nowhere near cold enough for the temperature to drop in this yet. It's just a convenient way for me to do things because like I say, it's quite small in here. Use the space the best you can. What I've also got 
<sighs> are my winter lettuces just coming on now and again I'm going to put some of them over here as well and I'm just ah, sewing a little every now and again to try and keep things going and also to replace anything that doesn't work we'll just have to see now what I don't have in here anymore the broccoletto quarantino riccio or the broccoli wrap to make it easier is all out in the garden now um because i did that before i thought of this idea of the bed things but i've got the pak choy in here the pak choy is not going out because it gets hammered by the snails our garden is full of snails um so it's staying in here and i'll do the best i can with it yeah so this is my little eight foot by six foot greenhouse. Oh yeah, so, just to show you, because I show you this a lot, so that's the spring onions now. Look how much growth they've put on. So I need to decide what I'm gonna do. Okay, the guys that grow spring onions every year like this, can I leave them in these modules over winter? Do I have to put them out? Do they need more space? Need your advice, guys. I'm not sure how well you guys can see. I'm doing my best, but this is the kind of tray you buy to put grow bags in. Um, I think they're about, I don't know, maybe like five or six quid in your local hardware store. Or you can buy them in packs. I got a pack of three, I think. Um, but I'm going to use that as a kind of temporary bed. Now, the difference with this compared to the one that I've used already is this is about half as deep. I would rather have something deeper, but this is what I've got. I'm trying to use what I've got to hand. So all I'm gonna do is fill this with soil. Now this is something that you'll see me do a lot in here. Not necessarily this actual filling a big tree and using it as a bed. But this is an eight foot by six foot greenhouse. So it's not huge and I need to make the best of it for all the different situations I've got. So that means at different points during the year, I actually change up in here, how it's laid out, what's in here, how it all works. Um, again, today, there are gonna be so many videos I'll refer to. So after you've watched this video, drop into the description of the video and I'll leave a big list because there is lots in there that I'm talking about that you can go and watch to catch up. But I move everything around in here to suit. So when I'm growing things like tomatoes that are tall plants, I can put my shelving units flat to give me more space. And then I put them up like this for winter, spring, when I'm wanting to work on benches and things. So in here, because it is a smaller greenhouse, I have to think a lot about making the most use of the space and how I access things. Hence why I've got all sorts of weird kind of shaped trees and things. It's to fit in my greenhouse. So my plan for this bed then is I'm going to put some of my uh, dragon's tongue mustard in this bed, some of the wave mustard. Um, what else am I going to do? Oh yeah, and my, some of my pak choy. I'm not going to go into a tutorial of how you do pricking out, potting on, all that kind of thing, because today's not a tutorial video, but there are other videos where I talk about it. So I specifically spoke about pricking out and potting on in the video when I did it with the sunflowers and things. I've done it in a video with peppers and tomatoes, all of that kind of stuff. I'll link them below, but I'm not going to do it today. What I am going to do is make sure I label. So, one, two, three Thank you. 
Here we go. So I've got Dragon's Tongue Mustard, I've got the Wave Mustard, and I've got just four winter lettuces on the end there. It's not anything spectacular or dramatic, but it's going to be interesting to see how that goes and how things take. It's all about experimenting. So I hope that's been fun then today, guys. Hopefully this has given you a bit more info and knowledge about why we do what we do and where everything is. And I hope you really enjoyed it. And as usual, if you like this video, click that thumb so it gives it a, a thumbs up and a like and lets us know. And also, remember if you haven't already, click subscribe and that way you'll get notified every time we put out a video and you won't miss anything. That's it for now then guys. Stay safe. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. Get out there and get gardening. See you guys.